Hi, my name is Pamela Coons, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Oncology at Yale School of Medicine and Yale Cancer Center. I'm excited to announce ASCO's new open access journal, JCO Oncology Advances. As the inaugural editor-in-chief, I hope to support JCO Oncology Advances to become the premier platform to bridge the gap between accessible scientific research and clinical care. Stay tuned for more information, including new article types, at ascopubs.org forward slash JCO Oncology Advances. We look forward to seeing your submissions in spring of 2024. This JCO podcast provides observations and commentary on the JCO article entitled Cabozantinib in Chemotherapy Pretreated Metastatic Castration-Resistant Prostate Cancer. Results of a Phase II Non-Randomized Expansion Study by Matthew R. Smith et al. My name is Emmanuel Antonarakis, and I am an Assistant Professor of Oncology at the Johns Hopkins Sidney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center in Baltimore, Maryland. My oncologic specialty is genitourinary oncology. Cabozantinib is an oral small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitor that is currently FDA approved for the treatment of medullary thyroid cancer. In preclinical models of prostate cancer, cabozantinib modulates the bone microenvironment and reduces bone turnover, putatively through inhibition of MET and VEGFR2. In the current study, the investigators evaluated cabozantinib in men with chemotherapy refractory castration-resistant prostate cancer in a multicenter, non-randomized phase two trial. Prior studies of cabozantinib in men with advanced prostate cancer have demonstrated significant and sometimes dramatic improvements in bone scan activity, which was often coupled with improvements in bone pain, while only modest PSA reductions have been observed. However, the optimal dosing of cabozantinib in prostate cancer patients is unclear and drug-related toxicities can be significant, especially at higher doses. The starting doses chosen for this study, either 100 milligrams or 40 milligrams daily, were based on the experience from two prior trials in which dose reductions were very frequent at the 100 milligram starting dose, but much less frequent at the 40 milligram starting dose, which also demonstrated clinical activity. The primary endpoint chosen for the present trial was a 30% improvement in bone scan lesion area. Bone scan lesion area, a fully automated, computer-aided lesion detection system, was developed to quantify therapeutic responses using technetium-99 bone scans and demonstrated good concordance with visual assessment by radiologists in a recent study. However, This endpoint has not been prospectively analyzed, and although the methodology has received FDA clearance, it has only been validated on a set of cabozantinib-treated patients. Therefore, while the use of bone scan lesion area is novel and certainly very interesting, its validity and generalizability as a proximal study endpoint remains to be determined and should be further defined within the context of larger phase three studies. Patients enrolled on the current study were heavily pretreated. All had progressed on docetaxel chemotherapy, and 73% had received at least two prior treatments for metastatic castration-resistant disease, one of which was often abiraterone. Over 40% of patients in each cohort required narcotic analgesics for pain control. Of note, although the study was designed and powered to enroll 150 patients, only 93 patients were enrolled in the 100 milligram arm. Subsequently, the protocol was amended to include the 40 milligram cohort in which 51 additional patients ultimately enrolled. In the 100 milligram cohort, as well as in the 40 milligram cohort, patients were dose reduced if unmanageable toxicity developed. To this end, the median daily dose achieved in the high dose cohort was only 55 milligrams, while the 40 milligram cohort received a median daily dose of 36 milligrams, 
suggesting that a starting dose of 100 milligrams is largely intolerable. That being said, bone scan responses were quite impressive in both arms. 73% of men in the 100 milligram cohort and 45% in the 40 milligram cohort achieved an improvement in bone scan lesion area of 30% or more, as defined in the protocol. However, one potential weakness of this trial was the lack of additional correlative imaging studies, such as MRI or sodium fluoride PET scans, which may have provided further insight into the bone responses observed using technetium-99 scans. In addition to these radiographic findings, markers of bone turnover, including C-telopeptide and bone-specific alkaline phosphatase, also improved in a significant proportion of patients. These reductions in bone biomarkers were comparable in frequency and magnitude to those seen using the bone-targeting radiopharmaceutical product, radium-223. Tumor reductions were also seen in about 80% of men in each cohort who had measurable soft tissue disease, although the proportion of patients achieving resist partial responses was only a fraction of this. Pain scores generally improved and allowed weaning of narcotics in over half of patients, although the durability of this pain improvement was not reported. Notably, the PSA response rate defined as a 50% PSA decline, was only 11%, suggesting that PSA is not a very meaningful endpoint in the setting of non-androgen receptor-directed agents. While the bone scan responses and pain improvements achieved with cabozantinib appear promising, questions remain about the tolerability of this agent as well as the duration of clinical benefit particularly at a starting dose of 100 milligrams daily, the safety of cabozantinib remains problematic with a high rate of grade three or greater adverse events, especially with respect to fatigue, GI intolerance, anemia, and hypertension. The present study also revealed an alarming high incidence of pulmonary embolic events. Reassuringly, the 40 milligram dose appeared considerably more tolerable than the 100 milligram dose, but was potentially less efficacious, although the two cohorts cannot be directly compared. Another sobering fact was that the total duration of treatment with cabozantinib was in the order of four months in both cohorts, with most patients coming off study due to clinical or radiographic disease progression. It would be interesting to know if these progression events occurred in bone or soft tissue lesions. Nonetheless, the short duration of drug exposure may hinder the ability of this drug to ultimately improve more distal outcomes, such as overall survival. As a relatively small, non-randomized study, the results of this trial can only be considered hypothesis-generating and the true value of cabozantinib in advanced prostate cancer will be defined in a phase three program involving two pivotal trials, COMET-1 and COMET-2. Both trials target patients with bone metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer who have previously received treatment with docetaxel chemotherapy in addition to abiraterone or enzalutamide. The COMET-1 study is a randomized trial of cabozantinib versus placebo with a primary endpoint of overall survival. The COMET-2 study is a randomized trial of cabozantinib versus mitoxantrone plus prednisone with a primary endpoint of confirmed pain response. Both COMET-1 and COMET-2 have chosen 60 milligrams of cabozantinib as the starting dose. Time will tell if this will represent a tolerable intermediate dose or if it will be too taxing for such late-stage prostate cancer patients. This concludes this JCO podcast. Thank you for listening. For more original research, editorials, and review articles, please visit us online at jco.org. This production is copyrighted to the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Thank you for listening.